Hello, everyone. I'm Greg Weaver. Welcome to The Audio Analyst. In early November, with episode 199, the amazing, affordable Fosse Audio V3 amplifiers, I introduced you to the ridiculously good-sounding, uber-affordable set of minuscule V3 monoblocks from China's Fosse Audio, built around the Texas Instruments Class D amplifier chip, the TPA3255. The TPA3255 is an amazing device, rated as either a 315 watt stereo or 600 watt mono analog input Class D audio amplifier. I pointed out in that episode that even as delivered from the manufacturer, these are some overachieving amps, especially in light of their level of performance and absurd affordability. Further, these Fuzzy amps, and to be honest, many other similar devices, not only offer circuits and boards that are populated with remarkably premium parts, but are also fitted with easily swappable dual op amps, the venerate Texas Instruments NE5532, installed in quick mount dip sockets. The 5532 is a dual monolithic bipolar internally compensated operational amplifier, or op-amp for short, introduced by Signetics in 1979 and is wildly favored and utilized in audio applications. Before we get into the meat of this upgrade discussion, let's make sure we understand some terminology, specifically understanding a single and dual op-amp and to know the difference between one fabricated as a semiconductor or built by discrete circuitry. Please keep in mind that I'll be covering some of the operational processes and technology under examination here in relatively broad strokes to explain some of the general concepts in play. Those interested in a deeper dive may wish to do more in-depth research on their own. A dual monolithic bipolar internally compensated operational amplifier in semiconductor wafer form, like the TI-5532, is a type of integrated circuit that implements two separate operational amplifier circuits on a single semiconductor chip. While the single circuit op amp device also exists, the FOSSI uses three of these dual circuit semiconductor TI-5532s. Now, these semiconductors are microchips, manufactured from materials like silicon and germanium. Now, the result is a complex transistorized circuit housed in a monolithic silicon wafer device that can provide its primary amplification element. Back at the dawn of CD players, most electronics manufacturers used this particular semiconductor in the CD player's analog filtering sections as a buffer between the uh, low-pass filter and the final analog audio output. Its balance of very good low noise and distortion capabilities, combined with its affordability, made it a popular and ubiquitous choice. In the late 1980s, as owner-operator of RGB Electronics in State College, Pennsylvania, I performed regular upgrades to the filtering and analog sections of CD players from manufacturers like Adcom, Denon, Magnavox, and Techniques. With parts substitutions, I was able to elevate the performance of CD players selling for as low as $329 or $459 in a manner that would allow them to sonically perform on the level of some $1,200 to $1,500 models. Acknowledging the inevitable advances in semiconductor fabrication and related technologies over the 45 years since the introduction of the Signetics ME5532, while the current Texas Instruments iteration of the 5532 may offer slightly improved electrical performance, in areas such as its noise levels, 
slew rate, and power consumption? Practically speaking, the performance difference is negligible and they can be considered functionally equivalent. To this day, their established performance and affordability still make them the popular choice for use in countless current production amplifiers, preamplifiers, phono preamps, sound cards, streamers, and CD players. Now, if we look past the obvious advantages realized by using a semiconductor device, and instead consider the limitations that come part and parcel with their use, we discover a host of obvious pitfalls and shortcomings. Such limitations include oversensitivity to environmental factors like temperature, their limited power dissipation, lower power handling capabilities, and a lack of control over the circuit's individual device tolerances, materials, and resultant performance. In general, the complexity of designing and manufacturing integrated circuits establishes the practical limits on their operation, performance, and functionality. What is meant by the use of the word discrete here is that their circuits are assembled from separate devices, typically the surface mount component variety of individual inductors, capacitors, diodes, resistors, and other such electronic components. Building a discrete op-amp from individual components allows for a much more specialized maximization of the desired performance parameters of the device. The result is that they can offer notably superior performance to their integrated circuit chip-based counterparts. The result is that they offer the ability to deliver a more detailed and engaging listening experience with improvements in sonic categories such as lower distortion, more efficient and greater output capability, and an ability to render music with much better imaging and sound staging characteristics than that delivered by IC devices. Okay, let's get back to the upgrade, how it works, and what it delivers. You may recall that I stated because the Fozzy V3 amplifier has three swappable op amps, it gives users the ability to roll their op amps, much in the manner that tube gear lovers can roll tubes to optimize their sonic results. The first of the three dual op amps in the V3 is used to convert the V3's native single-ended RCA signal to be able to drive its balanced input. It doesn't really change the operation of the V3, nor does it have any significant overall sonic signature. So this upgrade discussion will focus on the second of the three op amp locations in the V3. Now, for those of you who are curious, yes, you could replace both the second and third NE5532 in their DIP-8 sockets with upgraded devices. However, as I had already ordered just one pair of the highly regarded Sparkos Labs SS3602s, this discussion will focus on what I noted with that single device substitution. For clarity and convenience, links to the Sparkos Labs website, including how to purchase the Sparkos Labs SS3602 discrete op amps and their op amp upgrading how-to video are included in today's description section. I ordered my pair of Sparkos Labs SS3602 discrete op amps directly from Sparkos Labs in Colorado but they are also available as a custom order from Fosse as well. Sparkos Labs sells their SS3602s for $79.80 each, or $159.60 for the pair. I was somehow granted a 15% discount of $23.94 on my order, bringing the price down to $135.66. With $6.50 for UPS ground shipping, my total cost was $142.16, and they arrived in my mailbox in a matter of days. Once the two 564th inch hex head screws on the bottom of the V3, securing the bottom of the chassis to the Texas Instruments TPA3255 Class D amplifier chip for effective cooling, and the two others at the outer edges of the V3's back plate were removed, the whole amplifier slid open granting me full access to the boards. Removing the stock NE5532 op amp was a cinch. After gently prying it away from its seat in the DIPS 8 socket with 
a plastic IC extractor tool. You can use tweezers or a fine bladed micro screwdriver, just be careful. Uh, and within a matter of seconds, I was able to slip it completely out of its socket with my fingers. After making sure I had the replacement SS3602 in the proper orientation, I was able to quickly push it back into place. Please be very sure you follow the directions in the video so that you install the replacement SS3602s with the correct orientation. If you install it 180 degrees out of sync, essentially backward, you will not only destroy the op amp, but you may also damage other components of the amplifier. Now, one of the most likely difficulties you will encounter during the upgrade process is during the reassembly of the amp's chassis after the op amp replacement. Be very careful during the disassembly and reassembly of the front plate of the chassis. In particular, paying attention to the LED pilot lamp orientation. It is very easy to bend its leads changing its freestanding orientation and preventing its proper alignment with the hole in the amplifier's faceplate, preventing you from seeing it illuminate the amp's power status. Once the op amps were swapped, the amps were reassembled and reinstalled in my system, and it was time to listen. Damn! The speakers used for this evaluation range from my 1985 vintage BMW Matrix 1 monitors to my vintage 2005 Von Schweikert Audio VR1s with full crossover upgrades to a set of current production Studio Electric M5 three-ways reviewed in last week's E205. And all listening included my stereo subwoofers. One of the first things I noted after the installation of the Sparkos Labs SS3602s was an even more dramatic advance in the overall dynamism of things like musical scaling and dynamic expressiveness. I admit to being completely unprepared for how well these little lamps were now so clearly, effortlessly, and convincingly conveying the energy, expressing the vitality and contrast of the drive and shadings of musical passages. They were now so much more adept at expressing low-level detail and other microdynamic effects with compelling nuance. Probably the biggest enhancement I noted after the substitution was their ability to more vividly and accurately recreate the sense of a recording's space. Where the stock units had been very good, now, post-substitution of the SS3602s, the layering of the soundstage and specificity afforded to instrumental image locations and sizes were bordering on world class. Not only was the staging information presented with more deeply and finely delineated layering and specificity, but there was a more finely presented focus on their placement and the sizes and shapes of their voices, especially of those recorded en masse. The result was an even more convincingly realistic and compelling rendering of the sense of the air and space of the recording venue and its native ambiance. With these new discrete op amps in place, the changes they brought about were musically remarkable simply delivering performance enhancements far beyond what I would have expected or would have even believed to be possible. With them in play now, not only did there seem to be more definition and detail, but there was a newfound sense of authenticity and vibrancy to timbre, broadband, resulting in remarkably well-fleshed-out tonal color and texture. I want to note that where I had perceived some diminished proficiency with the extension, air, and shimmer in and above the uppermost octaves before the op amp substitution, it was not as notable now or even particularly apparent. While I typically find this to be a common limitation of even the very best silk, linen, or other textile soft domes, my heightened awareness of and sensitivity to it may be a result of my time with the extended capabilities of my reference Von Schweikert Audio Ultra 9s. Regardless, 
The results of replacing one of the two Texas instruments, NE5532 op amps, in each of the Fosse V3 mono amplifier circuits in my second space system is far from subtle. It borders on unbelievable. It is, in fact, the most cost-effective sonic upgrade I have experienced or can recommend for such systems. And not that the specifications of these two devices can tell anywhere near the whole story, but a quick look at some of the more obvious specs between the TI-ME5532 and the Sparkos Labs SE3602 may provide some insight. When comparing overall gain, gain at 10 kilohertz, and the spectral noise density measured in nanovolts per root hertz, the numerical advantages are clear and easy to see. A pair of Fosse V3 monos will run you about $280, whether you opt for the individual 48 volt 5 amp supplies or go with the dual 48 volt 10 amp supply as I did. Add roughly another $170 for the Sparkos Labs SS3602 discrete op amps with shipping. And for about 450 bucks, you've got a set of 240 watt amps at 4 ohms that likely will embarrass the performance of many of your buddies' well-researched stereo amplifiers, receivers, or even some monoblock systems in the $3,000 price range. While the Fosse V3 monos offer remarkable performance right out of the box, they are simply stunning sonic performers when upgraded using the Sparkos Labs SS3602 discrete op amps. I'd be lying to you if I didn't admit to wondering if it makes economic sense to install another pair in place of the second significant NE5532 per amplifier, or whether it would simply prove to just be a matter of diminishing returns for the additional $170 investment. I'm honestly not sure where I'll come down on this internal debate yet, so there may be a further exploration of these exceptional little amps to come. But for now, these tiny, affordable, Chinese-built monoblocks based on a Texas Instruments Analog Input Class D audio amplifier and updated with the Sparko Slab's discrete SS3602 dual op amps represent a level of performance that may well be unobtainable elsewhere for even six or seven times their cost. If you check them out, be sure to post here and let us know what you think. As always, thank you for taking the time to drop by today. Further information on supporting the channel may be found in today's description section or at my website, theaudioanalyst.com. Please stay safe and keep the music playing. Till next time, cheers.